pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <coughs> well, sometimes sermons come out of uh, conversations that you have with different people. And I was having a conversation with somebody uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, I talked about the fact that we could come go directly to God for uh, confession of sins. And uh, he came up to me a couple of days later and gave me a slip of paper with a verse on it. And um, uh, that verse of scripture was John 20:23. 20, so let's turn there to John 20:23. 20, and uh, <clears throat> and in John twenty twenty three it says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And uh so he said, see, this verse proves that we need a priest to have our sins forgiven because this was a command given by the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 disciples. Well, we know that there was at least, there was only 11 disciples left because Judas was gone. And uh, we'll look at the context and find that there was only 10 there, maximum. And so uh, we'll have a look at that. The first thing I do when someone gives me a verse like this is I like to have a look at the words. And so I looked at remit and indeed in the Strongs it means to cry, to forgive, to forsake, to lay aside, to leave, let alone omit, put away and the year of forgiveness uh, but also f forsaken, uh, being forsaken and to leave, to let alone. Uh, Thea says it's to send away, to permit, allow, not to hinder, to give up a thing or a person. Uh, it is to leave or go away from one um, <clears throat> and uh, to leave destitute or abandoned. And so, but it carries that idea of forgiveness as well. And so uh, we... we we look at that and, and both these times remit and remitted are the same Greek word. And so uh, we can have that there. But then it goes retain. Those that uh, retain, whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. And um, in the Strong's it means to hold by, uh, hold fast, to keep, lay hand on or obtain, retain or take. In Thea, it means to have power or be powerful, to be chief, be master of, to rule, to get possession of, to become master of, um, to hold in hand, to keep carefully and faithfully, to continue to hold, to retain. And so <clears throat> if we just took this verse, uh, then... You know, we could probably say, yes, well, we need to go to a priest, one of the representatives of Christ, to confess our sin um, at a stretch. But let's read the immediate context because that's the next thing I like to do. I like to look at the words and then I like to build and go further afield from this verse because ultimately Scripture interprets Scripture, amen? And so we need to have this one verse not just by itself. We need to expand out and we need to look at what the scripture say, says about these verses. So in verse 11, it says, But Mary stood without the sepulchre weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned back herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? 
She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast bo- have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus saith not, For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples uh, that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. So <clears throat> this is the same day that Jesus Christ rose. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands that Thomas is not present, but the ten were. There were ten there. But I ask the question, were there more than just ten? Because in the book of Acts, Acts 1, 12 to 15, there are over a hundred gathered together at one time. So were there just the ten or were there more? This is a question that uh, we ask. But it was possibly just the ten. These closest men that were around the Lord Jesus Christ. But then Mary had come to them and Mary had told them, uh, so were the ladies there? I don't know. We're not told. But the Catholics' argument that only these representatives could forgive sin and it's transferred down to the priests is a bit of a stretch. So we need to look at that context. What is the context? Well, in verse 21, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. What is the context of these words that come after? The context is that Jesus Christ is commissioning his followers to world evangelism. He is saying, you are to take my place in the world to spread the gospel. Now, if it was only the ten, I ask you the question, were only the ten sent out to spread the gospel? No, it wasn't just the ten. This was a commissioning time and and this is not the only time that Jesus Christ commissioned his disciples. Matthew 28 18 to 20. We know these familiar words. Matthew 8. uh, Sorry, Matthew 28. 18 to 20. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he gathered all his disciples together. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So we see that there was a commissioning there. In Mark 16, Mark 16, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples. In verse 15 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Is this the retaining and the remission that we were talking about? And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. Those that follow. Luke 24. <clears throat> And 47. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all the nations beginning at Jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things. So we need to see that Christ did commend and commission his disciples. And uh, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus Christ said, "All power, uh, not all power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And it wasn't just the apostles that preached the gospel. You see, in Acts chapter 8, after the death of... Uh, Stephen, after they had buried him and because of the great persecution against the church that was taking place at Jerusalem, all those that were there went back home. They had been there for the Feast of Pentecost and they'd been there, those that had been saved, staying around and and, uh, listening to the Apostles' Doctrine. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, Therefore, They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That's not just the disciples or the apostles because the apostles actually stayed in Jerusalem, we are told. Everyone else was scattered abroad. So this commission that Jesus said, go and preach the gospel, wasn't just given to the apostles, it was given to all believers. Then we see in John chapter 20 and verse 20, uh, and before verse 23, verse 22, I believe, that the Lord Jesus Christ breathed on his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Did the disciples receive the Holy Ghost there and then? That's a question. It's possible. It's possible that they received the Holy Ghost or was Jesus saying receive ye the Holy Ghost when he comes? Because in Acts chapter 1 he says that they would receive the Holy Ghost. Now it's possible that uh, just like the uh, Old Testament the Holy Spirit came upon people and left and and that sort of thing, but in Acts 1, the Lord told them to stay in Jerusalem. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Had they received the Holy Spirit in this new covenant situation? I don't believe so. But I think God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was preparing them for the day of Pentecost. And in verse 8, he says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and Judea, and in the uttermost parts of the, of the Spirit. This is in conjunction, in context with the fact that they are going to be witnesses. So if that is in context of being witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, then I believe this next verse in verse 23 is also in that context. And when did the disciples receive the Holy Ghost and how many were there? Well, in Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 and on, 
we know that the disciples received the Holy Ghost, they that were gathered together with one accord. How many of them were there? Well, we can back up to chapter 1 and verse 15. And it says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120 men and brethren. This scripture must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. And so we see that if the Holy Ghost was needed for uh, needed for um, <clears throat> needed for getting out the gospel, and it wasn't just the ten who received the Holy Ghost. It's not just the ten that uh, verse twenty three of John twenty relates to. It, de- it, it, it relates to all believers. And does that mean that his followers in evangelism evangelism can decide who is saved and who is not? That's basically what it's saying. If we can remit sins or we can retain sins, is that talking about the fact that we can can determine who's going to be saved or not? Who determines that? That's between God and the individual. You see, God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count snack, slackness, but his long suffering to us would not willing that any should perish. I believe this commission or charge to procla- is to proclaim forgiveness of sins, not provide it. So when we go back to John chapter 20 and verse 23, I believe that this is relating to the proclamation of the gospel, not the providing of salvation, not providing of forgiveness. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And in those words, in conjunction with so send I you, or even so send I you, uh, (coughs) are linked together. Now for a doctrine... To be a true doctrine, it needs to be mentioned in the Gospels, practised in the Acts and taught in the Epistles. Nowhere do we see in the Acts or in the Epistles this doctrine of coming to a man to confess your sins. Unless it's a sin directly against that person and uh, from, uh, not from God but from that person. But who can forgive sin? Only God can forgive sin. Uh, This is seen in many scriptures. If you want to write these down, I'm not going to turn them all. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. Mark uh, 2, 5 to 11. Luke 5, 18 to 26. Those are in relation to the man of palsy when he was lowered down to the Lord Jesus Christ and he said, your sins are forgiven you. What did the Jews say? No one can forgive sin but God. No one can forgive sins but God. And so it's important for us to realise that only God can forgive sins. Psalm 23, uh, sorry, Psalm 32 and verse 5. Let's turn there. Psalm 32 and verse 5. We'll look at a few book, passages of scripture in the Psalms. Psalm 32 and verse 5 says, I acknowledged my sins unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah, David went directly to the Lord. And we have more of a right to go to the Lord because of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Psalm, uh, sorry, Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28, verse 13. We nearly read that this morning. We read 27. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. We need to confess our sins to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have someone who we can go directly to 
that is our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We can go directly to him. We have a high priest in the book of Hebrews that talks about Jesus Christ being a high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 9.11 says, But Christ become, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And then again in Proverbs 4.14, 4, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted boldly before the throne of grace. Hebrews 10.19 Having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest uh, by the blood of Jesus. We see that we can go directly to God. Other people that went directly to God, David in the Psalms went directly to God and confessed his sins. Daniel in Daniel 9 went directly to God and confessed his sins and the sins of the people. Nehemiah in chapter 1 and verse 6 went directly to the Lord. He said, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and and my father's house have sinned. There are numerous occasions when people went directly to God and confessed their sin directly to God. We don't have to go through a priest. And besides that, we are priests, the Lord says. The way has been made open when the veil was rent from top to bottom the way to the holiest of all, access to our God was given to us that we can go directly to him and keep and confess our sins. I want to encourage you to keep short accounts with your sin. When we sin, go to the Lord. Confess our sins, but forsake our sins. That's what the Lord said. Confess and forsake. Let us pray. O oh, loving God, and Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for uh, your word which makes us clear that we can confess our sins directly to you and that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we thank you and praise you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time, its pages burn with a truth eternal and they glow with a light sublime.
The Bible stands o'er the hills, may tumble it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible. Stands. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of men. Its truth by none ever was refuted and destroyed, they never can.